we get to get into chapter 6, verse 9 this morning. And I'm really excited because it opens up like this. It says, this then is how you should pray. And, and I, you, you know, this is Jesus talking. So this is in the red letters here. And Jesus is saying, when you pray, this is how you should pray. So that's a pretty big deal. And I think that all of us at some point have said, you know, okay, I know I'm supposed to pray. What does that look like? How am I supposed to do that? Well, Jesus starts this out saying, this then is how you should pray. And I think he meant it. Amen. Like I think he was serious when he said that. So uh, this is a really important part of Scripture right here, and we're going to take a look at it. And I, There's a lot here. We're going to go take two weeks on this next few verses. The first two verses... Um, are the first half of this prayer. And there's a lot here. Uh, it's, it's packed full of stuff, but the first two verses talk about, uh, about our Father and, and, the, and who He is. And then the last half of this is about us. And so uh, we're going to look at the first half of that uh, today. Um, but before we begin with that, there's something the Lord is, was speaking to me um, about prayer. And I was thinking about prayer and, and, and how, why prayer is so important to us. On a real level, where the, where the rubber meets the road, what is it about prayer uh, that, that is really important? And, and what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me is that we are a strange and peculiar people. Yeah. We are strange and peculiar. The nature of who we are as Christians is strange. Um, we're earthen vessels that have the glory of God inside of us. They have a treasure that's the glory of God inside of us. We're people who sin, yet we're not sinners, we're saints. And, and, and I say that because sin, a sinner is a title. It's, a, it's an identity word. And though we fall short, we're not, we don't identify with our sin. We have the righteousness of Christ in us. And so we're in this, that's weird. That's strange. That we can be fallen people, but we're His. We're His kids. And we're righteous. And we have right relationship with Him. We, we, we're people that have God living in us, yet we live in a fallen and world, surrounded by fallen things. That's strange. That's weird. That's peculiar. There's this dual nature about us where we have God in us, yet we live in a place that's full of sin and full of death. That's peculiar. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on the unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we strive to keep our eyes on things that are not seen. That's peculiar. Usually eyes are used to see things. But we're called to be a people that see the unseen. Amen. To keep our eyes on the unseen things. And we strive to keep our eyes on the unseen, on the eternal things, the things of God. Yeah. Yet we live our lives in a place surrounded by seen temporary things that are falling away. Every day we live our lives surrounded by things that are decaying and are temporary and don't matter. So we're eternal people living in a, in, in a temporary place. And that's peculiar. So we're supposed to see the unseen things and keep our eyes on those things, but we're surrounded by seeing things that are temporary. So how... Dude, that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard. So we're in this war. It says our flesh wages war against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. That's hard. And if it isn't hard for you, examine your life because maybe you're not doing it right. I feel comfortable saying that because I'm not talking to a particular person. But if it's easy, I had a poster when I was a kid that said, if you haven't bumped shoulders with the devil today, maybe you're going in the same direction. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I like bumping shoulders with the devil. So, so here's the thing. We're, we're fish that are swimming upstream. Everybody else is swimming downstream, but we're going the hard way. It's hard being God's kids in a world that hates God. So what's the answer for us? How do we do this? How do we live lives for Him in a world that hates Him? And, and how do we keep our focus on the things that matter when we're surrounded by things that don't matter? And the answer is, is that we live a lifestyle of repentance. And I don't, when I say repentance, I don't mean that we live a life style feeling sorry about stuff that's not what i mean when i say repentance repentance isn't feeling sorry for something repentance that i'm talking about isn't even turning away from something because you can turn away from something that's bad it doesn't mean you're turning to anything that's good but the repentance that god requires of us is a turning our hearts and our minds towards him and what happens when you turn your hearts and your minds towards Him? You turn away from all the stuff that doesn't matter. And so we live a lifestyle of repentance. We live a lifestyle of turning our hearts and our minds towards Jesus, towards God, towards the Father, to His throne. We put ourselves before the throne and we stand before Him and we realign ourselves with His plans and His purposes in our life. So we live a lifestyle of turning our face towards the Father. And I talk about that today because that's what these two verses are talking about. The first two verses, the first half of this prayer that Jesus gives us, the first half of this outline is about this type of repentance, about turning and realigning our thinking and our eyes on the Father. So verse 9 and 10 says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Amen? So our Father in heaven, it's really easy when you read that part to sort of slide past it because it's almost the, uh, the opening address of a letter. Sometimes I, when I'm reading the Gospels or I'm reading the, the epistles, I, I, you know, the beginning part, this is written by Paul and it's written to this person. I kind of slide past that part because I want to get to the meat, you know. And it's really easy in this prayer to, to say, Our Father in heaven, okay, that's the address, we're good. Let's move on to what the meat is. But it's there for a reason. Matter of fact, one-eighth of this prayer is our Father in heaven. So it's there for a really important reason. And I, I don't think you can... There's a lot of significance in this one sentence. Our Father in heaven. What God are you praying to? I, that might seem a really silly question if I ask you what... God you're praying to and you might even respond to me well I'm praying to to the God Jesus's father but if I asked each of you to describe God to me I would get a lot of answers what is God like how does he feel about you what does he want from you Is he pleased with you? Is he disappointed in you? We have all kinds of different answers to these questions because we have an idea of God that's really hard to get rid of in our hearts. And the one God that's put forward more than any other God is the angry God. The God that's angry with us or angry with our country, or angry with the people that aren't doing it right, or that's disappointed in the church. 
And we put all of these things on God. And, and to complicate this even more is the answers that I would get to you about who God is from your mouth would be different than the answers I get if I could talk to your heart directly. Because we can say with our mouths, God loves me and God's pleased with me and He's not disappointed in me. But what is our heart saying? And so the beginning of this prayer is really important because it starts out, our Father in heaven. He's our loving Father. That part of the prayer isn't just there so God knows who to send the letter to. He included it because it's important for us on a daily basis as we pray to start out recognizing who God is in our lives. He is our loving Father. In Matthew 7, verse 9, it says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you, to those who ask Him? Your Father knows how to give good gifts to you. I, I was a few years ago reading this Scripture and struck me the idea that, yeah, if I ask Him for a fish, He's not going to give me a snake. But there are times in my life that I ask for a snake without realizing it because I don't know how to pray sometimes. And sometimes I ask for things that aren't good for me. But even when I ask for a snake, He doesn't give me a snake. He loves me enough to say no to some of my prayers. We have a loving Father. <clears throat> Hold on a minute here. My throat. So, when we sit down to pray... What better way to start out that time with the Father and reminding ourselves of who we're talking to? So when we come before Him and we say, Father, You have been so good to me. You have blessed me. You have never let me down. You have always loved me you have always provided for me you are my father and i am your child you love me and desire good things for me father as i'm praying to you i can think of all the times that you've held me in your hand. That you've made a way for me. That you have been faithful. Thank you for the things that you've done for me. Thank you for filling the gap in my life. Thank you for being there for me. For being faithful in my life. You have never let me down. And you can feel the whole atmosphere in this room changes just by speaking those words out. The burdens that you carry around with you that are, that are so heavy, you start talking about the faithfulness and the goodness of God, and those burdens get lighter. So we establish who He is in our life, that He's not a vengeful God. He's not an angry God. He's not disappointed in us. The Bible says there's no fear for us as we come in to the presence of God because He is our Papa God. He's our Abba Father. So we establish that. And then we, we worship Him. The next part says, Hallowed be your name. And hallowed is not a word that I use very often in my day-to-day -day life. 
right? It's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an archaic word, but it just means holy. Holy is your name. And holy means to be set apart. God stands alone. God does not have any competition. There's nothing that competes with God. The Scripture says that God sits on His throne and laughs when His enemies conspire against Him. God's not worried about stuff. He is above everything. He is above all. He is holy. He is unique. And He is separate from everything else. Because He is greater than all. There's no competition. I think it's easy for us to say that about God in the abstract. It's easier for us to say, yeah, the God that created the world, God stands alone. There's none like Him. There's none that competes with Him. There's no competition for God. But I think this prayer is asking for us to be personal with this. In our lives, is God standing alone? Is He above everything? In our lives, is there anything that's competing with God for our attention, for our affection, and for our heart? Have we put anything up against His sovereignty in our lives? Is God holy in us? And that's hard. <laughs> I'm telling you that the Christian walk demands humility because it's hard when God comes to you and asks you for something that's important to you. Are you willing to give it to Him? We have very strong feelings about a lot of stuff. We, we, we live in a time right now it's very difficult to walk the straight and narrow. It's very difficult to not get distracted by what's on the right and what's on the left. Because some stuff is easy to pick out. When the government is persecuting you and things are going against you and they're not doing things that you agree with and they're taking prayer out of the school and they're, they're legalizing abortion and all these things that are against Christ, that's easy. And that, that, I can see that stuff. But then on the other side, I have whole groups of Christian people that are reacting to that stuff poorly. And so you have to navigate the in-between those things. Because here's the thing. Jesus was a humble servant. And if your reaction is not humble service, but belligerent pride, you're probably not on the straight and narrow. It's hard. And the things that are hard aren't the obvious ones. The traps that are going to kill us are the righteous indignation traps. The prideful traps. The fighting back because we have to make a stand and we got to fight back traps. Because you do fight back, and you do make a stand, but you do that like Jesus did. As a humble servant. You know what fighting looked like for Jesus? Dying on the cross. That's stuff that we got to figure out. And it's not easy. That's hard stuff. So, is He holy in our lives? Are we willing to give up those idols in our life to serve Him? To make Him above all to us? He has to be holy in our lives. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. I you prayed this when, when I was a kid. I learned this prayer. I memorized it as a kid, which I think kids should do. But I used to wonder as a kid, because heaven meant something different to me when I was a kid. We're here on earth, and God's out there somewhere, and, and he's doing stuff in heaven. But I'm saying, your kingdom come and your will be done in, on earth as it is in heaven. So what's going on in heaven that he wants it to come here what does that look like? And I had this weird idea, like, like what does that even mean, you know? But I, I want to take a moment and b- very briefly paint a picture of heaven and earth. And it's going to be a crude picture because I don't understand it very well. This is kind of deep stuff, right? That I don't think anybody really understands this very well. There are some that understand it better than I do, though. Um... We think of heaven and earth as being these two different geographical locations. And while they're separate places, geographically they're the same. They overlap one another. But because of sin, we tore that connection between where God is and where we are. We broke relationship with Him. Okay? But throughout history... There have been times when heaven touches earth. The tabernacle was a place where heaven touched earth. And all the things in the tabernacle were pictures and depictions of things that are heavenly places like cherubim and angels and different things. That they would, it, it was a, a, a type and a shadow. But heaven, God would meet us in the tabernacle. would meet man. And heaven would touch earth in the tabernacle. Jesus. Heaven touched earth wherever Jesus went. Jesus was a walking tabernacle. And that's why it was such a big deal when He said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Because you don't forgive sins just anywhere. You have to do that in the temple. Not at Larry's house. Wherever Jesus was meeting and people were gathering, You don't do that just anywhere. But Jesus was a living tabernacle. Heaven touched earth wherever Jesus went. And He carried heaven around in Him wherever He went. The kingdom of God and God's will walked inside Jesus wherever Jesus went. They crucified Jesus. And He sent His Holy Spirit. So now, heaven touches earth wherever you go. You are full of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God and heaven touches earth. You are a living tabernacle. Wherever you go, you take Jesus and the Holy Spirit with you and you establish His kingdom. That was His plan and purpose. He, you guys are a carrier of the best condition you can ever have. You take heaven and earth with you wherever you go. So when we pray His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what we're saying is, Lord, manifest Yourself through us. Manifest Yourself through Your church. Let your presence, let your kingdom reign. Let your will be done wherever we walk, wherever we go, wherever we are. Let your kingdom be manifest in that place. Let us become a vessel for your Holy Spirit and your kingdom manifest itself on earth through your church. That's what we're praying. You can't take yourself out of that equation. You can't say, God, Your kingdom come and Your will be done all around me, but not in me, please. You can't say, in a general way, have Your kingdom come and Your will be done in a place. You're saying, Lord, Your kingdom come and Your will be done in us and through us. Manifest Your kingdom 
through your church. And this is a really important because when you pray to man, God to manifest His kingdom through your life, you're making a choice that that is what your life is about. If you say, Father, Your kingdom come and Your will be done, you're a vessel for His will, and there's somebody else's will that might have to be set aside for that. You can't carry both of those things. And so when you pray for His kingdom to come and His will be done, you're making a choice to set aside your own plans, your own agenda, and your own purposes for the sake of His kingdom, His will, and His agenda. But that's okay. Because... You go back to that first sentence of the prayer. And you learn that He's a loving Father. And that He wants good things for you. He wants to bless you. How much more will your loving Father who is in heaven give you good gifts? And when you begin to nurture that trust and really realize who the Father is in your life and how much He loves you and how much He wants to bless you, you, you're okay setting down what you wanted. I'm going to tell you that I didn't end up in my life where I wanted to. I didn't. But where I ended up was a lot better for me. Because my Father loved me and I chose in my life that God, this is what I want, but I want Your will to be done in my life. And so I'll give up what I want if You give me what You you have for me. And I've learned that He's faithful and that He loves me. You can't establish God's kingdom and your kingdom at the same time. But that's okay because your kingdom isn't that big a deal anyways. Your kingdom isn't that big of a deal anyways. The question I have for you this morning is are you willing to do that? Because that choice is before you. When you pray, God, your kingdom and your will be done, are you willing to make room for his kingdom and his will? And that's something we all have to chew on and decide for ourselves because there's no half measures here. (laughs) Remember when we were talking about uh, infilling of the Holy Spirit a while back? And, And I was like, you know, we're all baptized with the same Holy Spirit. And it's not a picture of us, each of us, getting a piece of the Holy Spirit in us. It's that the Holy Spirit is an ocean and we're people-shaped sponges that fall into it. We're all in Him. And the kingdom that He wants to establish is the same way. It's bigger than us. There's not room there for the kingdom that you want to establish for yourself and the kingdom that He wants to establish. But... His kingdom gets to be yours. Don't worry, little flock. It is the Father's great pleasure to give you the kingdom. So I want to close with this. I told you a couple weeks ago that that, that God's been teaching me some things about prayer. And one of the biggest struggles that I had was that I go to set aside prayer time, but I'm taking in all the baggage that I'm carrying around from my day and from my week, and I'm taking in all the stuff, all the busyness of the mind and the worries that I have and all the distractions that are going on and, and the things I'm wrestling with in the week. And I told you that he gave me some tips and tricks about prayer, about how to cut through all that stuff. And here's what it is. It's really simple. But here's the thing. When I go into prayer with all my stuff and I start my prayer 
by reminding myself that he is a loving father. That he's always been there for me and I speak those things out and I talk with my mouth about the things that he's done for me and the, th- the times that I didn't think I was going to make it, but he made a way. And I bring those things to remembrance in my life. And I talk about what a loving father he has been in my life. And I recognize that he's a loving father now. When I thank him for all that he's done for me. When I start out my time thanking him for who he is and what he's done for me. When I say that He is an awesome God and that He stands alone in my life and I will not have anything in my life that competes with Him. When I speak out that I want His will and His kingdom in my life, all of a sudden, He just cuts through all the noise. And all that stuff that I'm carrying around with me doesn't seem like such a big deal anymore. He's got it. And you know, the, the, the second half of this prayer has to do with us, our provision, and, 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 and some different things. And, and we're the focus of that second half. But we, if we skip this first half, you're not equipped to go into the second half. Because the whole first half aligns your life with His vision and His purpose and what He wants and you put yourself on God's team. And you partner yourself with Him. And then all of a sudden, going into that second half, like those things we're carrying around that were so heavy, they don't seem like such a big deal anymore. Because we know that God has been faithful. And He's got it. And now we're partnering with God in prayer. instead of just being worried and frantic. So that second half is all about us, but we go into it with a God perspective and a kingdom perspective when we get there. And it changes everything because that Scripture that says, make your requests be known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's where that comes from. It comes from Ebenezer God. So far, you have been good. That's where that comes from. That's how you equip yourself with that that peace is by aligning yourself with the Father. Amen? Amen. (sighs) Father, you are so good. You are so faithful. You are a loving Father. And when I think about the times that I've been in trouble, Father. I see Your hand. And Lord, I'm even thinking about our church when we first got here. Mm-hmm. And, and I was looking at the finances and, and, and I can look at a graph, Father, and see when the provision passed the line where we didn't need assistance from the denomination anymore was the same month that that assistance ended. Like I can see your faithfulness in that stuff. That little stuff that we shouldn't be worrying about anyways. I can look back in this place and see your provision and see your love and see your kindness. I can look back in my life, Father, and see the times that you've been a loving Father to me and to my sons. My oldest son, when I prayed for him to have a friend in school, and that very week you gave him somebody that could could be a friend to him for years to come. I see the times that you've answered my prayer, Father. You have proven yourself to be a loving Father in my life. And as a church, we just thank you that you are our Father and we are your kids today. Father, I just pray that in our lives, if there's anything in us that's, that's competing with you in our hearts for attention, Lord, If we have idols in our life that we don't know about, reveal those to us, Lord. We want You to be holy in our hearts. Set apart in our hearts above all else that's going on. Whether it's plans or purposes or worries or doubts. Anything that would compete with You. Anything that would steal the peace of God from our lives. 
Make Yourself holy in us. Holy be Your name in our lives. And this morning, finally, we just pray that Your kingdom and Your will would be done in this place. That we would be walking tabernacles of Your presence, Lord. That everywhere we would go, we would carry Your plans and Your purposes and Your kingdom and Your will. And I pray that You would help us to have a mindset that looks for opportunity to do Your kingdom business wherever we go, Lord. That You would give us divine appointments with people so we can connect with people and share Your love, Lord. That we would give divine words of encouragement for one another to lift each other up in encouragement, Lord that we would be supernatural kingdom kids wherever we go, Lord. And when we come together as a church, we're not here to have a church service. We're here as a gathering of the saints, Lord. To lift one another up and to have fellowship, to sing praises to You, and to hear Your Word, Lord, whatever You want to do. Your kingdom come and Your will be done in our lives. And we thank You that that will is loving us, Lord. That You are a faithful Father. That You are a loving Father. And we thank You for that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. I love you guys.